retired United States Navy, former Allied Supreme Commander, former head of Southern Command, and author most recently of The Restless Wave, a brand new novel which drops now. It's available at Amazon.com. About World War II, the run-up to it, and indeed the life of a young officer in the United States Navy during it. Admiral, I got to tell you, now have presented me with the Ken Follett problem. The Ken Follett problem is when there's one copy of a book and everybody wants to read it. So I got through half. The Fetching Mrs. Hewitt took it, finished it, and then gave it to her brother because we're leaving in a few days. And her brother, who's a USNA class of 67, wanted to read it before we left. I, honestly, you could have said two, Admiral. I'm kind of disappointed yeah. in you. <laughs> you know, I'll make a note of that with marketing. Um, and as you know, the book is intended to be the first of a series of novels that kind of follow this character through his life and times and the momentous years of the United States, World War II, Korean War, Cold War. So there'll be plenty of copies in the future of the Hewitt family. Well, we will, we will be talking about it at length in a couple of weeks when I finished it. I am up to Pearl on the day before when the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt stole the book and then spirited it away to her brother, class of 67, which raises with me the problem of misclassing someone. My friend, my, Miss Class Yearing, my friend Rhett Rasmussen runs besttalkgrill.com, and he was class of 1983, and I keep calling him class of 1981. Evidently, this is a problem with his classmates, and he talks a lot of, uh, they talk a lot of trash to him. Is that a problem, a general admiral, if you get the class wrong? Yeah, yeah it's a lot of points off, Hugh, so I'm, I'm not going to make you feel better. Um, one thing about the restless way that, that you know about is, there's a chunk of it in the beginning set in Key West. Ernest Hemingway pops in and out of yes. this book. And then our protagonist goes off to the Naval Academy. He's involved in a cheating scandal. He's in a, a love affair. Uh, he is someone who has his flaws. And as the book unfolds, there's kind of a love triangle developing out in Pearl Harbor when he arrives, a classmate, you'll never misclassify a classmate anyway, a classmate, a contemporary of Pierre, who happens to be a Marine officer, arrives on the scene, and they are fighting over uh, a young, beautiful woman. So that's going on alongside the backdrop of World War II, new technology, great power war in the Pacific. There's a lot going on in the book. I'm very happy about it. And Papa shows up in Hawaii, Papa being, of course, Ernest Hemingway. And it's it's kind of fun. That's a nice device. But I, I will bring that back up when we talk about it. But no more misclassing uh, Brett Rasmus in class of 83. Admiral, I want to turn to something very serious. Right now, the Israelis are planning a retaliatory strike. Yesterday on this program, former President Trump said they are entitled to one. Entitled, not necessarily bound to do it, but entitled to one. If they go through, let's imagine for a moment that Joe Biden says, help them any way you can. What would that mean in terms of the Lincoln strike group and any other assets that we have either in Qatar or throughout the region? If the president said, help the Israelis strike back, what would the United States Navy do? It, it'll be not only the Navy, but you're right to point out um, it, anything the Navy would do and Lincoln and the 80 planes in her air wing. Uh, but alongside that would be a significant ground-based air force effort coming from principally our big base, al uh, out in Qatar. You'd see special forces involved alongside the Israelis. You'd see cyber offensive and defensive. We already do a lot of this. There'd be massive intelligence that would focus like a laser on all of the targets in Iran. A lot of that happens routinely, as you know, Hugh. But if the Israelis decide to really go big with the strike, uh, and the U.S. decided to throw all in with them, it would be all hands on deck, not just the Navy. It'd be Navy, Marines. You'd see uh, special forces from the Army, uh, the Air Force, obviously. It would be a very significant effort. Now, Admiral, if the Israelis say, we want to hit X, Y, and Z, and for whatever reason, the American administration does not want them to hit one or all of those sites, do they impede or do they just stand down? And if they stand down, can the Israelis pull it off? Uh, 
I assume what you're talking about, let's be blunt, is the nuclear facilities. Correct. And that, that's the high end of the target list. Um, if I were advising the Israelis, I would be saying to them, uh, hold that one off to the side until the Iranians are actually closer to producing a deliverable nuclear weapon. They're at least a year away from that. That's based on public commentary by the director of the CIA uh, as recently as yesterday. So I would say to the Israelis, you got time. Uh, what you ought to be going after at this stage, I would say, is the military industrial complex, principally the places where Iran is producing ballistic weapons, drones, cruise missiles, perhaps their offshore uh, oil and gas facilities might be a target. That overall military industrial complex, Hugh, it's just a much easier target set. The Israelis can absolutely do that uh, on their own. Uh, this is, for my money, not the moment for a strike on the nuclear facilities. Now, uh, what I discussed yesterday with President Trump is that not, no one really has any idea what they're talking about in the security cabinet. But he said if they take a shot, the world will understand why they take a shot. How difficult as a technical question is that shot if they go after, I think there are about a half dozen uh, critical sites to the nuclear program. How difficult a shot is that, especially if the Americans say we're not, we're not involved? It's an incredibly hard target set as follows. Um, Iran, a lot of people don't appreciate how big the country is. It's almost three times the size of Texas. Um, the nuclear program, you're correct, there are probably six principal targets, but there are at least 25 sites around the country that we know of. Um, there are probably others that even at this moment with all of our combined joint intelligence with Israel, we don't know about. And some of the most critical sites, Hugh, are buried hundreds of feet underground, not under dirt or sand, but under granite carved out of the side of mountains. Think the U.S. Cheyenne Mountain, where we have our nuclear command and control facilities outside of Denver and Colorado, near Colorado Springs. Very, very hard target set. Uh, again, my counsel to the Israelis, there are plenty of juicy targets you can go after. Um, let's see what happens with the, uh, with the Iranian nuclear program. Ultimately, if you're gonna take that program out, you really wanna do that with the US. No, Admiral, I, I don't know of any open source. I, I'm inquiring as an open source matter. Do the Israelis have cruise missiles? Oh, yes, absolutely. They have cruise so, missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, sea launch, uh, and land base. That's what I was getting at, the sea launch. I know they have a submarine fleet. I did not know if they had submarine launch cruise missile capability, and if they did, can they get them close to Iran? Because it is an enormous country, and people think of Tehran. Tehran's in the east. There's this incredible western part. I don't know where the nuclear facilities are. This is a targeteer's nightmare, I think. It absolutely is. Um, there is a great deal of this on open source. There's an excellent article today in the New York Times that describes in some detail the complexities of this strike. I, I think it's it's popular to, to say, yeah, let's go after the nuclear sites. Um, if you really get your head into it, even at an unclassified level, you see how challenging the target is. Final thought, um, this is at least a thousand mile flight, uh, much of it across contested airspace uh, into the heart of Iranian air defenses. Their air defenses are not great. They're kind of C, C plus but they're S-300s. They've got some aircraft that could get up and fly against the Israelis. So you've got to put fighters in this strike. It's not a strike you can just do with the Israeli capabilities of cruise missiles, which are not at the level of the United States. So it's got to be manned aircraft. It's a long flight. It's contested. You're going to lose some planes and some pilots. Maybe some hostages emerge. Um, uh, again, go after the easier target set would be my military advice to my Israeli friends and colleagues. 
Last question, Admiral, because you're sitting there with a backdrop of New York City behind you. You must be up at the foundation. Uh, the attacks on Beirut, all we see are explosions and secondary explosions. What's your impression of the Israeli campaign against Hezbollah in the suburbs of and getting closer to the airport of Beirut? Uh, I think it's gone uh, to plan. I think it is uh, militarily rock solid. The conduct of the Israeli Defense Forces uh, from everything to include special forces have been maneuvering across that border uh, for months. Uh, their pinpoint strikes against command and control targets, even when they have to go into Beirut to dig out the command and control of Hezbollah, they're doing everything they can to minimize collateral damage. And I think if you compare the collateral damage that occurred during Gaza and the collateral damage now in equally dense Beirut, you can see the Israelis have improved, learned lessons, doing everything they can to minimize it. They've got to service a number of difficult military targets. I think they're doing it with real professionalism. Last question, Admiral. How difficult is it for the, the chain of command is President SecDef CENTCOM commander. The CENTCOM commander was back in Israel this week. How difficult is it for Lloyd Austin to get direction on the specifics of this with the president? Because it's a very complicated task set, no matter what is decided. We got a minute. I, I, I served seven years as a combatant commander reporting directly to the Secretary of Defense and to the president. Um, it's always hard to get detailed guidance. So Lloyd Austin's challenge is to continue to present the president, the National Security Council, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, the combatant commander is the one moving that up to SecDef and the president. You've got to put options in front of them and force them to make choices.